For a while now, I've wanted to start talking about game mechanics in addition to level design, and since Dark Souls has over the last few months quickly become one of my favorite games of all time, I figure what better to start with than its bonfire mechanic. I want to take a look at what makes this checkpointing system so interesting to me before turning an eye toward the future and making some predictions for the release of Dark Souls 3 early next year. In addition to healing you and refilling your Estus Flask, or your health potion, bonfires do a few really interesting things. First, as you progress through the game, you'll find items, either purchasable from merchants or dropped by bosses, that expand what you can do at bonfires. Initially, you can't do much more than level up and restore your humanity, but as the game progresses, you can gain the ability to do stuff like repair and reinforce weapons and armor, store items outside your inventory, and eventually even warp to some of the bonfires you encounter. To me, this really fits the identity of Dark Souls as a role-playing game, since it provides an avenue for growth aside from your character's stats and items that's entirely driven by your actions and choices in the game. Second, and most important to me, is the way that the game connects bonfires to enemy respawns. Most of the enemies you've killed, aside from bosses and mini-bosses, are resurrected whenever you use a bonfire. This can be done by simply resting at one, reviving at one after you die, or by returning to the last one you visited using the Homeward Miracle or a Homeward Bone item. Many other action RPGs I've played either have enemies respawn on a timer or when you move from one area to another, and From Software's decision not to do this has a number of implications for the game's design. By avoiding timer-based respawns, Dark Souls puts more control in your hands when it comes to farming souls by repeatedly killing enemies. If you want to collect the souls from a group of enemies multiple times, all you need to do is loop back to a bonfire to bring them back. On the flip side, however, there's no way to use a bonfire without triggering a respawn, and this single-handedly shapes the way you move through the game. As you explore a new area, two things are likely to happen. First, as you learn where the enemies are, and you'll find that many are often hidden, lying in ambush, you're probably going to take a few hits, making you use up the charges of your Estus Flask to heal. Second, as you kill the enemies you find, your collection of souls will grow. These in turn have two critical effects. You become more vulnerable to death as you use up your Estus charges, and a potential death becomes more costly since you drop all your souls when you die. Remember, reviving at a bonfire after death brings back all those enemies you've just killed. Therefore, because you drop all your souls where you die and you need to navigate back to your bloodstain to retrieve them, dying farther away from a bonfire makes it harder to get your stash back. This serves to give you a choice as you explore and your Estus Flask starts to run out. You can forge on and risk losing your souls, or you can go back to the last bonfire and recoup. This lets you try to leverage what you've learned to progress farther without needing to use your Estus Flask to heal. This second choice is, to me, the crux of the design behind the bonfires. You're challenged to master an area so you can get to the end and face the boss with as many Estus charges as possible. Though this mechanic is one of the key reasons for the game's infamous difficulty, it's really From Software's way of setting you up to improve without holding your hand. The game is designed so that your eventual success is entirely of your own making, and I think that's pretty awesome. This also has implications for the way you perceive the game's difficulty. As we've already established, exploring a new area means that you'll gradually run out of Estus charges and accrue a bigger bank of souls. This builds tension as death becomes more imminent and you become more keenly aware of just how many souls you'll lose if you die. Finding a new bonfire or returning to a previous one, either by backtracking or finding a new shortcut to it, relieves that tension. This build-up and release of tension is core to the game's pace, and it's the direct result of the placement of bonfires and shortcuts. More tension builds up in areas where the bonfires or shortcuts are farther away from each other, which can color your perception of an area's difficulty. For example, the new Londo ruins are often cited as one of the game's harder areas, and a large part of this is the fact that they don't contain even a single bonfire. To me, this sets Dark Souls apart as a great example of how the placement of checkpoints affects the perceived difficulty of a level, which is a universal truth in game design. Think about a time when you had to face a hard boss that was like a half hour of gameplay away from the nearest checkpoint. Even if the preceding area isn't incredibly difficult, it might start to get frustrating or annoying if you lose to the boss a few times and have to run through it over and over. Eventually, you might even start to perceive the area as harder than it really is entirely due to a badly placed checkpoint. In Dark Souls, multiple attempts at a boss mean you can collect a lot of souls on the way there, so as long as you can reach your bloodstain, you're still making progress as these souls start to add up. By doing this, I feel that Dark Souls gives us the tools to avoid this frustration while still helping us understand what causes it. This effect that the placement of checkpoints has on a game's feel is why I want to look ahead to Dark Souls 3. Back in June, we learned that, in addition to the existence of the bonfires placed by the developer, Dark Souls 3 will enable players to create bonfires in some capacity. 
Given what we've already discussed, this has some huge implications for the level design. Unfortunately, I don't have any secret insider info to share with you, but we can make some educated guesses as to what we might see, based both on what we know from Dark Souls 1 and from other games outside of the series. This will be a totally new mechanic in Dark Souls 3, so even though I haven't yet played Dark Souls 2, there are a number of predictions I think we can make based on how bonfires work in Dark Souls 1. I think it's safe to predict that there will be some sort of limiting factor on the creation of bonfires. I don't think From Software would want to allow players to trivialize their game by making a conga line of bonfires stretching across the game world. One way that they could do this would be to limit the items needed to make the bonfires, similar to the way that Final Fantasy VII gave you a single save crystal you could place anywhere in its final area, which otherwise doesn't contain any save points. I wouldn't be surprised if we end up having to find the swords stuck in the bonfires of the previous games, and that we can't move bonfires after placing them. If only a set number of these items exists in the game, this would make choosing a place for a bonfire a potential double-edged sword, pun entirely intended, that requires careful consideration. Given that your choices in Dark Souls can have effects as big as preventing key characters from ever appearing, this wouldn't surprise me in the least. This isn't the only way that From Software could limit our ability to make bonfires either. Back in June, The No leaked information that included details about a rumored sacrifice mechanic by which you would sacrifice the corpse of an enemy to travel to another player's world, either to help them or to try to kill them. Included was the possibility that doing so would create a bonfire in your world, their world, or possibly both. If true, this could also mean that a sacrifice will be required when creating a bonfire just within your own world. This would fit the lore, as we can see here from the description of the Homeward Bone item, that bonfires are fueled by the bones of the undead. I'm pretty sure that not all the enemies in Dark Souls are the undead, and I know that at least some of them don't have, you know, bones, so I could see From Software limiting what enemies could be used for bonfire creation. I wouldn't be surprised to find that they make a special type of enemy whose corpse is the only kind you can use to make bonfires, and setting it so that each one can only be used to make a single fire. The final thing I want to discuss, which unfortunately will remain nothing more than a question for now, is how player-made bonfires might work with regard to warping. In Dark Souls, you could only warp to certain bonfires, and we already know that not every bonfire in Dark Souls 3 will be player-made. With that in mind, I'm excited to learn more about how player-made bonfires might factor in. As of right now, we don't know if we'll be able to warp to the bonfires we make, or if we'll only be able to warp to some or all of the ones that From Software places throughout the game. One possibility that occurred to me is the idea of a separate bonfire network that would allow players to warp only between the bonfires they've made. This would probably be pretty tough to balance, and I'm pretty sure it would upset the established lore behind bonfires, so I don't think it's terribly likely. At the same time, though, it would allow for a new level of player choice and customization, so it wouldn't be entirely without merit from a design perspective. If nothing else, we can at least say that it'd be an interesting inclusion, however unlikely it may be. These are only a few of the possibilities of what we could end up seeing when Dark Souls 3 launches early next year, and I'd love to hear what some of your thoughts are on it. If you have any theories on how From Software might pull this off, I hope you'll share them in the comments below the video. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me next time.